Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to have you with us today. If you're one of our church members and regular attenders, welcome. Great that we can have fellowship in this way. And if you've just tuned in as a visitor today from somewhere else, even another country, to our website or YouTube, you are very welcome today as we open the Word of God together. And let's just ask God's blessing now. Father, we just thank you that your Word is very relevant to the situation we're in right now. And we just pray you'd open our our eyes to what you want us to see from the teachings of Jesus. Please teach us and encourage us and challenge us today in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a theme that is running through the Bible of human responsibility, that people are actually responsible for their actions and people are responsible for what they do with information that comes their way. And particularly if God says something, we are responsible to listen and we are responsible to respond appropriately, for example, with obedience. And we see this emphasis emphasized in the Old Testament that God had something to say. Jeremiah said, hear the word of the Lord, O house of Israel. God wanted to be heard. The prophet Isaiah went to King Hezekiah and said the same thing, hear the word of the Lord. God announced judgment upon Jerusalem in Jeremiah's day, but he said that the people would not hear. God says to the wicked in Psalm 50, you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. And yet on the positive side, we considered last week that Jesus told the parable of the sower and anyone who takes the word of God into a receptive heart becomes a fruitful and productive person. So there's both a challenge and an encouragement when it comes to the word of God and when it comes our way and our response to it. And remember that last week at the end of the parable of the sower, Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus really wanted to be heard. We move now to the next section of Mark chapter 4. We're going to be looking at Mark 4 verse 21 to 25 and I've headed this section revelation of truth and then after that we'll look at a short parable on the growing seed and our focus there will be the growth of God's kingdom. So let's look first of all at this paragraph because Mark chapter 4 is mostly made up of parables but uh, some parables are long in the Bible. They're whole stories like the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son. Then we have these short sayings. We could call them parabolic sayings, just little short sayings, but they are also little earthy illustrations with a spiritual meaning. So let's look at Mark 4, reading from verse 21 to 25. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? And not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This section is one of the harder teachings of Jesus to interpret and there are different views of the meaning of verse 22 in particular. But if we think through it and we weigh it up with what Jesus is repeating and other things Jesus says in the Gospels, I believe we can come to sound conclusions. So let's begin with verse 21 where Jesus doesn't actually come out and say something, he just puts out a question. It's really a triple question. Notice verse 21, he says, is a lamb brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand. So Jesus is reasoning with the disciples here. He's appealing to their sense of logic. He doesn't state something. He frames it as a question and that question is meant to draw out of them some answers. Now in that culture they use lamps. They use little clay lamps that were fueled by oil and obviously in a, in a Palestinian home, if you just had a small little clay lamp, you would need to put that in an appropriate place so that it can give light. Uh, you want it to give the maximum amount of light in that room. So you certainly wouldn't 
put a lamp under a basket. You certainly wouldn't put a lamp under a bed. Uh, none of those people would get a light going and then go and put it behind a cupboard somewhere. That would be to counteract the purpose of the lamp. Uh, but Jesus doesn't actually say that. He wants them to say that. He just puts it out there as a question. And any reasonable person would answer Jesus, yes, uh, you, you would not put a lamp under something else. Uh, that would be to defeat the purpose of the lamp because the function of a lamp is to light up a room. So you wouldn't do something counterproductive like conceal it. Uh, that would be a bit like someone today uh, during a blackout and the, the power goes out at 9 o'clock at night so they're fumbling around in the house and they find a torch and they find some AA batteries and they put it in, turn it on, great, now I've got light. But then they open a kitchen drawer and put the torch in there and shut the drawer and just leave the torch in there for the rest of the night. Uh, that would be to counteract the very purpose of a torch. So back then, where would you put a lamp? You would put a lamp on a stand. You put it up high on a stand. And another version renders Jesus' question, don't you put it on a stand? That's, that's the logical thing to do. So that's this little parable. A lamp shines and radiates a room, so put it in a good place. The important thing is, what's the meaning? Well, let, let's look at where Jesus goes next, because this just flows into verse 22. Notice... You know, every word in the Bible is important. Notice verse 22 starts with a connecting word, for. A little word that speaks about a reason for what's gone before. Verse 22 reads, For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. So the purpose of a lamp was to give light. It's not just an ornament. It was a useful item for a home, and they would reveal things. And As the ESV puts it, a lamp would make something manifest. So imagine someone, for example, losing a ring and they can't find it anywhere. Well, let's light a lamp. Now I can see my ring. It's over in the corner. That's the purpose. So, okay, what's the meaning? That lamp in G this little parable obviously represents something. He's not just giving a lesson about lamps. What it represents is the teaching of Jesus, specifically Jesus' kingdom teaching, which is a focus of the whole chapter. Jesus came into the world as a light. He himself shone, but then beyond that, Jesus' teachings exposed darkness. Jesus' teachings revealed things. As his message went out, people reacted in various ways as the light of his teachings shone on them and even shone on the darkness of people's hearts. And that's why... When we looked at the parable of the sower, there's four responses. Jesus would teach something. You get some people who resist it. You get some people who like the message at first, but then fall away. Then you get some people who like it, but then they get distracted and the word of God is choked like a seed is choked by thorns. But then you get the fourth category, the good responders. They, they hear Jesus' teachings, they take it in, and they bear a lot of fruit. They become like a fully grown plant that is producing a lot of grain. So, Jesus' presence as the light, but specifically here, Jesus' teaching just radiates, and that would just expose where people were at. That would, that, that would actually reveal people's hearts. You could have an audience there and they've all got a certain heart condition, but it's concealed. And then Jesus comes along and starts shining the light of his kingdom teachings and all of a sudden, whether that person is receptive or hard-hearted or easily led astray, that starts coming to the surface because it's exposed just as like a lamp exposes darkness. You know, Jesus actually divided people into for and against. We have a incorrect view of Jesus if we think Jesus came to bring everybody together. Jesus did not. He didn't come to bring all the Romans and the Greeks and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He wasn't an olive branch man who was just functioning, you know, like the World Council of Churches tries to do or different ecumenical movements, just try and bring everybody together. Well, interfaith movements, we've got to get everybody together 
just like you're cooking a stew. You just put a bit of everything in. That's not what Jesus was about. He actually split the community. He actually divided people into for and against. Don't take my word for it. You can read it in your own time in the latter part of John chapter 3. We read in John chapter 3 that light came into the world. That's Jesus Christ. And what happened? Some people loved the darkness rather than the light. In fact, John said some people hated the light. And that word hated can be translated to detest. So Jesus would appear on the scene. He'd give his cutting-edge teachings. Some people would warm to him. Some people would be receptive and have their lives transformed. Other people said, I can't stand this. I can't stand this man. Crucify that man. Because his teachings exposed their true heart condition. So that's what's going on. Just like a lamp shines, Jesus' kingdom teaching just brings up to the surface, brings into the light where people are at. So friends, there, there is an application of this to you and me today when it comes to witnessing or various forms of evangelism. We can expect... If we proclaim the teachings of Jesus, expect this. Some people will warm to it. Some people will take it in both hands and get saved and get changed. Some people will become very uncomfortable and will even shoot the messenger. That is to be expected. Any time you are distributing the words of Jesus Christ, every time you are pro proclaiming the message of the kingdom, his word is going to be searching and his word is going to be exposing hypocrisy and other things that were always there. So that's one way to read verse 22. That's why I say there's a couple of interpretations. So one way is that what is hidden is the heart and sin in the heart and Jesus' teachings expose that. But just to be fair, I do want to share with you another angle, and I think they're both actually biblically valid. There is another angle on the meaning of verse 22. Some commentators say, no, what's happening here is it's the secret of the kingdom that will be revealed. So they're saying that this is actually a positive verse that Jesus taught in parables, and that was hidden from most people. But later on, as the disciples went out and preached, those true, the true meaning of the parables would now be revealed. So what was hidden would now come to the surface and be manifest. So that is another way of, uh, that's a more positive interpretation, doesn't mean it's a better one, but that is a more positive view on how to read verse 22, that it's not sin being revealed, it's God's kingdom that would be revealed. Well, there is truth in both. On one hand, Jesus' words did expose the sinful hearts of people. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. And what happened? Did people come up and embrace Jesus? No, they picked up stones to throw at him. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. What happened? What kind of reaction did he get? The Jews picked up stones to stone him. John 10 verse 31. We can expect that as his teachings exposed people's sinful condition. And then there's merit to the other interpretation that the hidden meanings of Jesus' parables would later come to light for a lot of people who initially had rejected them. Whichever way we go, um, there's two ways of looking at it, but verse 23 is not really hard to comprehend. Verse 22 is a challenge, but verse 23, have a look at how simple that is. It says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus just putting the message out there, listen, I want you to listen to me. If you have your Bible there, and I want to encourage you while we are streaming services and um, we're not putting as many things on screen to actually have a Bible with you and be following through. And if you have a Bible with you, notice this strong emphasis on listening. Have a look at Mark 4, verse 3. Before he tells the parable of the sower, Jesus says, listen. Then at the end of the parable, verse 9, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him here and then in the very next verse pay attention so there's a very strong theme here from Jesus that he wants to be heard how are we going with listening 
How receptive are we? Friends, we always gain when we listen well to what Jesus has to say. Do you believe that? There's nothing to lose. We always gain when we have a soft, receptive heart. On their missionary journey, Paul and Silas went to the city of Thessalonica. Paul goes into the synagogue and he preaches Christ and some people accepted the message and got saved. That was great. Other people reacted badly. They heard the same message. And some of the Jews got a mob together and they set the city in uproar and Paul and Silas actually had to leave the city and go to the next place, Berea. And in Berea, they got a much better reception. Uh, Luke, the way Luke describes it is really a contrast. Luke says this, These Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if things, these things were so. They set a great example. They didn't dismiss the gospel preaching. They didn't get fired up and attack the messengers. They received the message, but then they checked it out against the Old Testament. Their mindset was, what we're hearing is different. We're going to check it out. Does Paul and Silas' message line up with what we have of the Bible? Let's have a look. It does. It does line up. And they took it on board. And the very next verse says, many of them believed. What a tremendous example. Not to, not to have a dismissive spirit or a hard heart, but just to listen to what we're getting, listen to a sermon, listen to a Bible study. But as Paul says in Thessalonians, test all things. Not reject all things, test all things. And if we test and we think that's not scriptural, throw it out. But if we test it against the word of God and it holds true, that's something to be received. May God help us to be smart when it comes to assessing things by the written word of God. And if it's accurate, taking it on board. Actually, just yesterday at home, I was watching a short video where a speaker was doing a critique of a well-known TV preacher. And he wasn't harsh, he was, it was quite fair, his critique, but he was just revealing some of the false teachings of this very popular teacher, mainly by quoting what they had said. So it was not so much just a critique of them, but he was just putting out their quotes of what they had said in their own books and preaching. And some of it was so bad, some of the things this person was saying was so unscriptural, I thought to myself, isn't this odd? This person is teaching things that contradict the Bible and yet has a huge adoring audience. So what does that say? That makes a statement about the lack of discernment among their hearers. That people are just swallowing false teaching instead of walking out. And there is an appalling lack of discernment in the world today. And I just want to give a warning. While we're going through this corona a virus situation and some of us maybe are watching more things on YouTube than we normally do maybe some of us are listening to speakers we've never listened to before that's okay with caution we need to check everything we're hearing with the word of God because not everybody with a suit and tie and a microphone in their hand is preaching the truth not everybody with a huge TV audience of millions can be trusted we need to be lining everything up does it line up with God's word and with Jesus King teachings. Well, let's continue with Jesus' line of thought. Let's go to verse 21, 24. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. That's positive. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So obviously there's a really good benefit here to being a good listener. You actually get more. You actually, if you take in Jesus' kingdom teachings, you actually reap some rewards. You are favoured by God. And so what Jesus is doing here with the word measure is he's using a marketplace illustration. A measure is referring to the instrument, like scales, but the word measure also refers to the amount. I've got a good measure of rice today. You can use it both ways. So Jesus is saying, look, if you're a good listener and you pay attention to what I am saying, you'll get more. You'll get more. And one possible meaning of that is God will graciously give you an even expanded capacity to take in more and understand more and apply more. But you will get more. You will be a winner by being a good hearer. 
If you're a diligent hearer, it pays off. William Barclay comments on verse 24, this is true of study. The more study we are prepared to give to any subject, the more we will get from it. That's a logical conclusion, is it not? If you study microbiology for three hours every day, you're going to know a lot more about microbiology than someone who's just watched a one-hour documentary on the BBC. Right? But what, what, what you are putting in, you are going to get back. It's just a sound principle. And particularly if the things you take in, you absorb, and then you allow that to shape what you are doing, you, are, you, you can make a positive construction to that field now because of all you've taken in. So the person who reads and reads and reads and absorbs, their hard work is going to pay off. Their application is going to have dividends. Some of you, I'm sure, have found this to be true in your area of discipline. You studied science. You studied accounting. You studied philosophy. You studied psychology. And you applied yourself. And then you reaped the benefits. Barclay goes on to say, this time talking about the Bible, a superficial study of a subject will often leave us quite uninterested, whereas a really intensive study will leave us thrilled and fascinated. So there are rewards for disciplining ourselves to studying the Word and just taking it in and letting, us, letting it shape us. For example, if you approach a book like Leviticus and you say, this book isn't that easy to grasp. But I'm going to discipline myself to reading it. I'm not going to jump over this in the next few and then start again in Judges. I'm going to read Leviticus. You will get a reward. You will learn things about the holiness of God you would not have learned had you skipped over Leviticus. What about a book like Hebrews? One of the harder New Testament books to read. If you and I will discipline ourselves to read the book of Hebrews and grasp it and apply it, we will come to an expanded knowledge of the saving work of Jesus Christ. That is worth doing. That is a tremendous gain. Then Jesus reaffirms it in verse 25, for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So God will leave, some people just miss their opportunity. God even takes away from them the little bit that they had as a judgment because they weren't willing to pay attention. So we need to be aware of that. To be exposed to the teachings of Jesus and be dismissive is to suffer a consequence. All the advantages are with the good listeners. I remember a number of years ago, it was probably about 20 years ago actually, I visited a church for the evening service and they had a guest speaker who I've heard a few times and I found him to be an excellent Bible teacher, one of the best I'd heard in Sydney. And um, he just made the point. He said, you know, some people are deep. There are some people you meet and they're just, they're just deep. They're the kind of people you want to have discipling you. They're worth following as they follow Christ. They've just got some depth to them. And then he said, some people, you talk to them for a few minutes and you think, that's about it. That's about it. You know, we can all be deep by getting into Jesus' truth. We don't have to be an intellectual desert. We can have a mind that's like a forest by just devouring Jesus' truth, reading all the red letters. Read it, devour it, apply it. Go back, read it again, devour it and apply it. And we will grow. We will develop. We will have a bigger contribution to make into the lives of other people. So I want to encourage us today to take in a good measure and God will bless us with more. Well, let's move on now. We're going to move to our next um, Bible reading, which is the growth of God's kingdom. And this is a short parable that's only actually found in Mark's gospel. You're not going to find this anywhere else. And I'll just read it to you. Mark chapter 4 from verse 26. The growth of God's kingdom. 
And he said, the kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground, he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, he does, he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. So this links back actually to the parable of the sowing. Both parables, you've got seed, you've got sowing going on, you've got some seed growing. But in this case, this parable is all positive. No seeds getting eaten by birds here. There's no seed suffering negative fates. This parable is a real encouragement. So we've got the challenge of the first section. This section is more encouraging. The point is this, friends. God's kingdom is growing. It's growing by the sovereignty of God. There is some mystery to it. The kingdom is growing even though you and I don't understand all the mechanics of it. The kingdom of God is growing even though we don't have control over much. Very little. God is just growing his kingdom. So what actually is the sequence of the parable that points us to this? You've got a man sowing seed. As time goes by, days turn into nights and nights turn into days. And Jesus says he sleeps and rises night and day. Time is just passing by. And during this period, even while he's sleeping, the seed sprouts and grows. It's a miracle. That farmer can be curled up in bed. He's not getting up at midnight every night fretting, thinking it's not growing fast enough. Maybe I need to dig around and move the seed. Maybe I need to fan it a bit or get out the watering can. He doesn't need to do anything like that. There's no fretting needed. There's no effort needed, even while he's sleeping. And, and sleep could take up a third of a farmer's season. If he's, if he's sleeping eight hours a day, eight hours out of every 24, over the course of of a season, a third of his life can be spent in bed. And yet during that time, the seed is growing. How do you explain that? It's got life force inside it. By God's divine design, there is life force in that seed. If you take a seed and put it in the soil, something dynamic happens. Something that didn't happen while that seed was sitting for six months in a sack. But there's something that I can't explain. You get it out of the sack, you get it into soil, and under the right circumstances, that seed starts to grow. And so Jesus uh, uses these two key phrases. You'll notice one is in verse 27. The farmer doesn't know how. He can't explain it. And then in verse 28, the earth produces by itself a crop. So there's something strange going on here that is not due to the farmer's activity. There's a mystery. If a scientist turned up on the farmer's property and said, tell me exactly how does a seed grow into a fully grown barley stalk, he could not do it. He lived before the age of the microscope. He could not ex explain it biologically. And you know, even today, there is an element of mystery. I want to tell you a short story about this. A couple of years ago, I was actually sharing on this very parable in a church on the north side of Brisbane. And the church service finished, we all moved into another room, we're having morning tea. And this man came and stood right up close to me and told me that he used to be a farmer in Tasmania. He used to grow carrots and broccoli and other crops. And at first I felt a bit intimidated. I thought maybe I made a mistake and he was going to correct something I'd said about farming or agriculture. But no, he said that as a farmer, there were times when he would sow seed and after a few weeks, nothing happened. The seed would still be in the ground. So he went to the scientific division of a company and he asked them about it and they told him two things. They said the soil temperature for growing that plant has to be 14.2 degrees. Two, they said after that, we don't know. We don't know. Isn't that amazing that even in the 21st century, with all our technology and our knowledge of biology and microbiology, there is still agricultural mystery. 
And that's Jesus' point. Let's match it up. That The picture is the crop, but what's it pointing to as a parable? Obviously, it has a spiritual meaning. The point is this, friends. God's kingdom is growing, and there's a mystery to it. People are getting saved, and we can't explain it. Have you ever tried to explain conversion? How someone moves from darkness into light? Have you ever tried to explain in detail regeneration? How someone who is spiritually dead is born of the Spirit, is born of above, and suddenly they are alive spiritually? Can you explain that in great detail? The mechanics of that, and how it happens, and how some people can hear the same gospel preaching and have two very different responses it's very difficult in fact I'd say it's impossible to explain there's an enigma to how the kingdom of God grows Jesus said this to Nicodemus the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone who is born of the spirit friends there's a mystery to it It's not something to be confused about. It's not something to worry about. It's something to praise God for, that God is growing his kingdom even while we sleep. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you could share the gospel with someone and a few weeks later, you're curled up in bed, fast asleep, and they are lying awake in their bed under conviction of sin. And the seed that you sowed, God is using to stir up a concern for their soul. And in God's time, they reach for Jesus and trust in him for salvation. Do you believe that can happen? And you didn't engineer it. You you just sowed seed. You didn't bring it to pass. It happens. God is growing the kingdom one soul at a time. He promised through Isaiah, his word would not return to him void. It will accomplish the thing for which he sent it. So let's be encouraged. I mean, the parable finishes with a harvest, doesn't it? There's a harvest. People are entering the kingdom. People are coming underneath the reign of God. People who were rebels doing their own thing are submitting to Jesus Christ and bowing the knee to him as Lord. It's happening. God's doing it. We just got to keep sowing the seed and making disciples who will then sow the seed to others and God will grow the kingdom. Are you a member of God's kingdom? Are you living under the reign of God? Or are you doing your own thing? There may be someone who's tuned in to watch this today. God, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. You've been doing your own thing. You've been living life the way you want to. God is sending out a call today. God is saying to you, turn from your sins and trust in my Son who died on the cross for you on the cross. He died on the cross as your substitute. I invite you today to reach for him, to see God's son on the cross, taking all the weight of your sin upon himself. Just reach for him. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, what does it say? God will consider what he'll do or God might do something. No, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God will respond to that. So I'm not going to put words in your mouth today, but I encourage you, call on the name of the Lord and God will save you. He will not disappoint anyone who reaches for him in faith. What about those of us today who already know Jesus Christ? I just want to finish by repeating, really, the two applications we've considered. Number one, let's be good hearers. It's very similar to last week, the parable of the sower. Let's be good hearers. But then expect the reward of gaining more. God will honour diligent hearers. So we're going through a coronavirus pandemic. And some of us have a lot more time at home than we normally have. And I want to just say today, that is a golden opportunity to waste a lot of time. I mean, you and me could triple our amount of TV watching during this. Particularly those of us who are finding ourselves with more free time, more time at home, more time sitting on the lounge. It's a golden opportunity to just waste a big chunk of time and then look back on it later and think, what a waste. I watched a lot of movies. I didn't experience any spiritual growth. And I want to encourage you today, don't squander the opportunity. This is an opportunity, a golden one, to get deeper into the Word. 
Read the Word of God. Buy a study Bible. Go online. You can use the Reformation Study Bible, the Global Study Bible. Free resources online. And just dig into the Word of God and make this a growth spurt. This time of increased isolation can be a time not of spiritual decline, but a real upswing in your Christian experience. So, yeah, let's do that. Let's really get into the Word and capitalise on this extra time we have at home. And let's be encouraged by the parable of the growing seed. As well as taking in, let's be giving out, sowing the seed and believing God to give the increase. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today. Jesus has done it again. Every time we open up something Jesus said, there's going to be something relevant, sometimes challenging, sometimes uplifting, but there's always going to be something that hits the mark and he's, he's done it through this passage to that group of disciples. We're privileged to listen in. Please, please, Jesus, do your sanctifying work in us through this passage we've considered today. Help us to be good listeners who reap the benefits of that discipline and help us to be faithful sowers, confident in the mysterious growth of God's kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's have some more praise and worship.